smiling face this morning. God's doing many things in our lives. We just want to thank him for all the things that he's begun and the work that he's doing in you and in me. Let's pray for this morning's service. Lord, we thank you again. We come humbly before you. Lord, we thank you for everything you begin in our life, Lord, that we will walk uprightly. Lord, that we would learn from your word and apply your word in our lives as we walk our daily lives, that our light would shine before those that are in a lost, dark, and dying world. Lord, we thank you for the service this morning. We thank you for all the people that are here, those ones that couldn't be here this morning. We pray a special blessing on them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together. Let's all squeeze, squeeze on in there, guys. There you go. Come on. <laughs> Welcome again to Open Gate Church. God is so good. I always think about when we come together that we get to meet with Jesus and his effect on us. It's overwhelming sometimes. That's going to happen to you if your eyes are open and your ears are open and your heart is ready. And there's no better way to really focus our attention on the Lord than to focus on his promises to you and I right he's got some amazing promises and it does just make you so thankful so would you join us as we celebrate the goodness of our god he is so good to us
right now, just give that problem to him right now. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, lay it on his shoulders. Hallelujah. Here we go. There you go.
out of my mind, messed up, jacked up. You guys have heard the deal before. Anthony said, man, you can do it, brother. You got you to get through this. You got you to gotta fess up to all the things you've done. You got to be honest with yourself. And I remember I was in, I had gone to jail and got out of jail. And, they, and I just remember walk, I walked from, uh, it was downtown. I walked all the way to, um, it was by the mall. And I remember, um, I said, man, I can't do this. And so I got locked up again, and this last time I said, okay, man, I'm, I think I'm ready. And it was Easter Sunday, huh? And I'm going to tell you, man, those grave clothes came off. They started flying off. I remember going to the home. I cried. I had drugs. I snuck drugs in my shoes. I said, man, I got to get that last kick. I got to get the last. And I went in, and um, man, look, at, I have a daughter, you know, my, my daughter right here. And I just think, man. When I sing that song, I, I, I know what it's like to be in that. So this morning, if you, you're ready to get up out of that grave, just tell them, Lord, Father, I need you. Lord, I can't do without you. Lord, I'm ready. To, I'm ready to do what you've called me to do. You guys ready? All right. Sorry to go. I'm, I'm a little long-winded this morning. Sing these songs. Here we go. Ooh, got a story good to hide. I was a blind man wandering until I saw the light. I got a story I can't deny. I'm a living, breathing miracle, and I just gotta testify. Come on, church.
anymore? No, 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 nobody. Come on, you, got, you ready? No, 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 nobody. <laughs> no, 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 nobody. We could get some of the trumpet lights back there, please. As we worship, we're going to speak the name of. Right. Yesterday I was talking to Pastor Anthony. I said, it's all about God. I said, oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. Jesus. And he goes, no, no, it's okay, Roz. He goes, you got to, you know, because I got to remember that because sometimes I, we get, at first it was a little weird. Kind of, why are we doing this? What, what's the, what's the deal? Why are we doing what? Why do we say God? You know, why are we, I'm changing, you know, why are we saying Jesus instead of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm like, okay, Lord, show me what this is, you know. And what it is is we want to understand it's not this, um, it's he is a actual, we want to come face to face with a living, that makes sense, a living deal here. And it's, his name is Jesus. It's not, because you know, God could be this. When you say Jesus, you're talking. You're talking to a person right in front of you. He is real. That's right. He is there. You know what? Nothing can, God, Muhammad cannot take his place. You could say, oh, man, God is here. That could be Muhammad. That could, so God's working on me with that, but we're going to speak the name of Jesus right now <clears throat> over our, our community, over our country, over our family, our friends. Right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Sing it together, okay? Sing it. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within Christ. I speak Jesus. Every family, Lord. 
finances. I believe, Lord, that you can do anything. Lord, when I call on your name, Jesus, mountains are moved. When we declare the name of Jesus, things begin to change. Sicknesses begin to go away. Not because of what we have, but Lord, because of what of who you are. Let's just sing that again. Your name is power. Your name is power. Sing it. Your name is healing. Your name is love. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a flame. Your name is power. Your 
we speak your name over this whole morning, Lord. Every family, every representative here, let your power be manifested in us, let it rest in us, let it flow in us, and let it strengthen all the cracks, all of the, the weak spots that are in us, Lord. We rely and trust in you today. In your name, and all of God's people said, amen. Let's get out of our seats for a few moments. And why don't you express that power, that strength in your life with someone around you. great time of worship. We had a good time just praising the Lord, celebrating his goodness in our lives. He does give us so much to sing about, even in spite of wherever we're at on a spectrum of uh, from everything is going good all the way to the other side of the spectrum. We're like, can anything go good? <laughs> right? Some of us, we're all over the place in that spectrum, whether we're way over here on the left, way over here on the right on that spectrum of how events are ha happening around us, God is with us. 
His power and His strength are with us, and His love and His embrace is there for us. And all we have to do, though, is lift our eyes from wherever we're at on that spectrum of things happening and events happening in our lives. Lift our eyes to Jesus. You know, it reminds me of the story. It's it's fresh in my mind because uh, me and Reuben went deep sea fishing yesterday. We were out. We went out there out of Morro Bay, and um, and uh, Reuben was a little nervous because he's like, "Am I going to get seasick?" I'm like, "I'm, I'm you know, because that's always that's a fear." And you know what? You should be afraid. <laughs> Anybody that hasn't been seasick, it is horrible, especially on these trips, because you are the boat is not turning back. You literally, if it's a all day long, long eight hour trip, you're suffering with flu like symptoms, nauseous for eight hours. <laughs> and there's been times that the whole boat. Everybody has gotten sick. I've heard of the full, like everybody on the boat got sick. <laughs> so we were just there this past week, I mean this past Saturday, and only one person got sick. Poor guy. I felt my heart went out to him. I've been seasick twice in my life. And it doesn't matter, you know, how seasoned you are as a sea mariner or, you know, a, a person that's been out on the ocean. It can happen all the time. It's there's something, I don't know what it is with our body, but anybody that's been out to sea uh, enough times, they've been seasick once or twice. And um, so I was feeling sorry for her. But the question that he was, that he, he told me, he said, they're telling me that I should stay focused on the horizon, you know, just, uh, just keep my eyes on a, a fixed point so that way I don't get seasick. That's sort of what happens when you and I are in this spectrum and our life is a storm. And we're on the boat. You remember Peter? When Jesus called him out onto the water? He was able to walk on water because his eyes were fixed on Jesus. And when did he start sinking? When he looked at the water. Oh, how beautiful it can be. How raging it can be. Immediately, brothers and sisters... When you're focused on those events, when you're focused on those things that are going on in your life that are just not going well, you will sink. Guaranteed. Some of us, we might be sinking right now. And we're just, and, and you might be feel, feeling condemned. Don't feel condemned. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. God will lift you as you fix your eyes on Jesus. That's why these songs are really important that we sing on Sunday mornings. It helps us to focus on Jesus, right? I mean, not, not all of us, when we come into church, do we have a smile on our face? You know, there's struggles or different things we're going through. But as we focus on Jesus, he turns our frown upside down. <laughs> he puts a smile on our face when we put our focus on Jesus. Today we're going to learn about Jesus and we're going to learn a portrait of true power in this world. True power. I say true power because there are people that are, they walk around like they're powerful. There are forces in this world that when you look at them, it seems powerful. But we're going to see true power portrayed this morning in the scriptures. But before we do that, we have a few announcements we want to share with you. Thomas is going to come up and he's going to share some of these with us. Everybody, welcome Thomas to the podium here. Good morning, everyone. First announcement for the week will be Monday. Celebrate Monday night, celebrate recovery. Uh, Five thirty is dinner time, and between the hours of six and seven is the worship and lesson, um, and sometimes testimonies. Uh, between the hours of seven and eight. Uh, there, there's groups that break up. Women stay in the congregation. Men go over to the fellowship hall and just discuss things that are on their mind and, you know, what God's dealing with them in their lives. Tuesday mornings, we have Bible studies over at the Palms. It's at 10 o'clock every Tuesday morning. They get together down there and uh, 
share God's word with the with the residents and the staff. Tuesday nights is prayer night. Pop the Tuesday is what it's called. Prayer, the power of prayer, exactly. Here's and it's here at the church at six o'clock every uh, Tuesday evening. We'll get together and we pray for one another, but we also pray for members of our families, um, the nation, things that are going on. We pray. Uh, the scripture that's tied into that is Isaiah 56, 7. I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with my joy in my house of prayer. I will accept the burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And we also have our... Um, we also have... Uh, well, we're still getting um, taking donations um, for our... Um, homeless ministries uh, so anything that you can uh, donate uh, and supplies uh, clothing shoes socks it's still summertime so it's still warm out there but anything to help out uh, toiletries things of that nature um, you can either see brother Jim or sister Maria Mangasser and then we'll you know they'll take facilitate what the needs are so and then uh, this Friday evening we have youth and uh, so we're going to do something different this week. Um, we're going to go out to uh, the boulevard. This, uh, so we're going to get together at 6 o'clock and go out and uh, have some time of enjoyment with the kids, you know, and just spread God's love on them. So thank you guys for the week. We also have, thank you, uh, Thomas. We have one other thing that's being coordinated by one of our members here at um, uh, Open Gate, and that's... Um, Tracy, he's going to share a little bit about this uh, um, this ride. And um, wh what's this ride for? What's, what's, what's it's a, a Jameson. Excuse me, the Jameson Children's Center. We're, we're uh, um, uh, getting together. We're going to ride motorcycles. We're going to drive cars. We're going to we're going to have a really good time. And, and uh, the, the Jameson Center is for the kids that uh, uh, they get taken out of uh, abusive or uh, um, neglectful uh, situations. It's it's where they go the first few days before they're, they're assigned to a, uh, either back to family or, or to a foster home. And uh, um, they usually come in with nothing on their backs, but the clothes on their backs, so to, or with nothing in their hands with the clothes on their backs. And we want to see to it that they've got more than just that. Um, so what's the, what's, what is this ride? Oh, it's September 23rd. It's a ride. We're going to ride around the county. We're going to... Um, uh, I am so hoping. I've got about 100 responses, so that's 100 motorcycles. So I'm hoping for a lot more. We're gonna we're gonna ride out to a um, we're gonna ride out to a fruit stand. We're gonna ride out to the uh, Bakersfield National Cemetery. Uh, Father Mike E. Uh, I can't pronounce his last name correctly. Espejo Espejo Espejo, Espejo um, is gonna preside over us out there at the um, at the cemetery. We're going to stop at an Arco station, or the, the the owners would really love us when they when we show up, and then we're going to go straight to the Jameson Center, where we're going to show the, the kids the bikes, um, the, hopefully lift their spirits a little bit, and then we go to the Bakersfield Esports Center for the final. For we're going to have a barbecue, uh, hot dogs and hamburgers, and uh, uh, raffles and 50/50s and uh, big red fire truck, and we're going to have a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. So, Well, yeah, that's the the, uh, the 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 entry fees and the raffles and the 50/50s is is all for donations for the uh, the Jameson Center. We can't give them cash, so what we'll do is we'll be buying them goods. Um, uh, Bakersfield Harley Davidson also is going to put out boxes with the wish list. Oh, that's another thing that happened that was so cool with the wish list uh, um, for the people to to donate. The COC, the Council of Clubs. Uh, here in the area, uh, they're unfortunately there's some one percenters, but they care about kids. Uh, I distributed that list to them, and they're going to do their best to fulfill it too. So uh, um, it's looking really good. But this has been so blessed. God has blessed us so much with the, this event. And uh, if you can, love to have you out there. Uh, if you don't have to run the run, just show up about 1:30 at Bakersfield Esports, and uh, there's going to be vendors. There's going to be Music. <laughs> the pastor's going to bring his music and sing for us, hopefully. <laughs> I, I asked Ross. He said he didn't know. So we'll see if Ross comes. We'll have our bunch. And um, um, 
Hope to have a really good time. Oh, the teens need especially. Um, that's something that uh, that they pointed out to us when we met with the Jamison folks. Is the teens um, um, really need nice shoes, clothes to go to court, things like that. That they're um, the the little kids get provided for real easily, but the it's the older kids they forget about. So uh, uh, if you can keep them in mind, so, thank you. Amazing, you know. You just think about it. There's a there's a lot of stuff that goes on in families, and when there's domestic problems, who are the ones that suffer the most? The kids. And how traumatizing it is when the kids are taken, taken away from the parents. It happens a lot. Jameson um, Center, um, it, um, it, they have to, it's, it's a hard phase in the lives of these kids and these workers that are there. It's, it, it, it takes everything out of them to try to figure out how to connect with these kids because they've been traumatized. Basically, they're traumatized. You know, and it, it causes all kinds of things, that, all kinds of emotions to come out of the kids, um, whether they're teenagers, whether they're young kids or whatever. It's just it's heartbreaking, heartbreaking. And but it's um, I don't want to say um, to uh, this to normalize like this is OK, but this is what happens in a broken world, which is what we live in a broken world It's scarred by sin and so you have all of this brokenness all over the place so thank you my brother for thinking about jameson center and those it's our right on no but god has a way of helping us get to the, with a spot where we need to do you know get in there coordinate and god is opening doors isn't he he's providing all kinds of stuff and so um, we want to be behind you in this, brother. We want to really connect with you. So, And it, it blesses our community, especially during a time when it's critical for in these, the lives of these kids. So let's bless them. Let's figure out how God is going to bless these folks, these youngsters. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that, my brother. Really am. All right. So let's, um, we're going to open our Bibles to John, uh, John chapter 19, which, yay, we're finally, we're finally in James. I mean, I'm sorry, John. <laughs> what the heck? John 19. We finally moved ourselves out of John, uh, John chapter 18, and now we're in 19. And so... Um, we are going to go over this portion where Jesus is sentenced to be crucified. This is after he, has, he was arrested, Peter's denial, and the high, priests were, or the high priest was questioning Jesus. And then Jesus is before Pilate. He has some interactions with him. And so now we're at the place where it's sentencing time for Jesus. So Jesus has been brought to Pilate. There's been some interactions. He's had some um, interactions with the religious elders who some of the soldiers were there when he was talking to the religious elders sort of truthfully. And they were shocked by how truthful he was because how many know the truth hurts? And so the truth was hurting. And so one of the soldiers went up to him and slapped him in the face. And he says, this is, this is the way. Is this the way? that you, that you um, answer and talk to the religious leaders. And so Jesus said, did you slap me because I told you the, something false? I am speaking the truth. And that's what his purpose was, to speak the truth. And so now we're going, we're moving on to the next phase of this whole night. This is one night, the longest night in the world for Jesus. You know, everything is happening in one night. Talk about betrayal. Talk about brutality. It's like 24 hours of hell on earth. So pray with me as we ask God to help us understand his word. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our eyes to see you, to see the, the moment and the events that are happening around this time in your scriptures. 
that we can understand who you are, we can understand what you're doing, and we can understand you and us and how we relate and how we can um, better rely on you. We lean on your word today. We lean on your Holy Spirit in your name. Amen. All right, John chapter 19. <clears throat> and we're just going to go through um, up to verse 16 to see if we can get going on this. <clears throat> you ready? Go ahead and get those scriptures up there, my brother. What we're going to do is I'm going to just read from verse 1 all the way to 16, then we're going to go back. So we're going to go pretty fast in the beginning, then we're going to go back to verse 1, okay? All right. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King, Je King of the Jews! <clears throat> and they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders instead insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took Jesus. All right. You see the scene here? This is like moving to the end of his interaction, the sentencing of Jesus. And go back to verse 1. We have a, a lot of interaction that's happening between Jesus and Pilate. And then we have a lot of other interaction between Pilate and the religious leaders. So we have this triangle of relationships going on and communication. So let's try to break it up. Just remember those three things. Jesus, Pilate. Pilate, 
the Jewish leaders. That's what's going on. Okay? And then you and I are observing it. We're looking. And what is John's purpose in writing this whole book that he wrote? He wants us to see that Jesus is the Son of God, number one. He's the Messiah. And in the beginning, starts off in the first sentence, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? The Word. It's like, who's this focus? What is, what's this Word all about? The Logos, the, written, the Word. And then in verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, John says, And the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. So in other words, it's got this triangle, the Word and God, the Word is God, and the Word became flesh. So it's sort of this um, roundabout way. It's not as clear as day, but if you study and you find and just let God open your mind to what is John trying to tell us, Jesus is the Word, and Jesus is what? Jesus is God. Remember? That, that's, the Word is with God. The Word was God. And the Word became? And who's, the, who's that that came, became flesh? Jesus. So in other words, you put all those things together, the, you can come, you understand clearly that Jesus is God. God with a capital G. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And this is who is standing before Pilate. God is standing before Pilate. Pilate is representative of power, authority that is in this world. Seemingly, right? Remember, even when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying with his disciples, all the authorities came. We, we studied this in the last chapter. They came with lanterns, torches, and weapons, swords. And what did he do? What well, that was all representative of authority, of power, of force. He runs out of the like this is this is the garden right here, right? Here they're they're coming, and he's like, I'm gonna meet them right where they're at. And he asks them, Who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And they all fell back. It was like a piercing of earth, a piercing of that at that split second where heaven and God and the kingdom's power pierced that darkness and really displayed who is, really has the power and the force. Jesus is God. Say it. Jesus is God. Jesus is God, and nothing can stand in front of him. Nothing can thwart him. Nothing can push him back. There are things in this world that loom in front of us, making us think, oh, they're powerful. That is powerful. That, I can't even come against that. There are things like that in this world. But brothers and sisters, when we're connected and in relationship with Jesus, nothing can stand in your way. Even if it means, sometimes seems like, you know, authorities or powers in this world are bigger and more powerful. Sometimes it seems that way. But it's only there to, it serves a purpose. Just like Finally, Jesus says, they ask him again, we're looking for Jesus. I am he, I told you. I already told you when you fell back, remember? When you're on the ground laying down? I am he, who you're looking for? They arrest him. They put handcuffs, they, they bind him. And like you can bind somebody who just made everybody fall back. 
with a word. I am he. I am. Everybody. Is this, were those things really holding his hands together? No. You see, so, so what is going on there? It's Jesus showing us that when there's a purpose behind conflict and sometimes it seems like the authorities in power, there's a purpose and a plan behind it. He's following along the purpose and the plan of redemption for you and I. So even though it seems like they had him in a, a, arrested, he wasn't arrested. He could have done whatever he wanted. He could have broke, broke out. He could have done whatever. But he was going along with this whole thing because he knew his father had a plan in and through it. And now here we have an indicator of the pilot took, you can almost say, God and had him flogged. Yeah. The pilot took Jesus and had him flogged. What's that? He was whipped. Jesus was whipped. And so, sometimes when we're, when there are seemingly powers and authorities and things that are trying to show their authority, they inflict, what are they going to do? And try to inflict pain. They're going to try to inflict torture. They're going to try to inflict some kind of, uh, something that makes you think, I am in charge, you're not. Could Jesus have stopped this? Yeah. But he didn't. He went along with it. You know, there's some things in this world that we try to stop. That's one of the things that's probably um, one of the, I say, I, I say problems and weaknesses of the church that's in the West. When I, the church in the West, in California, on the West Coast? No, no, no. The church in the West is the church that's like the United States thinking. You know, even Britain and West, West, um, the Western culture, Western civilization, you know, where we have all these, um, uh, we have all these leaps forward in the comforts of life, indoor plumbing, huh? If that's a good thing, <laughs> huh? <laughs> right? Clean water, a justice system, we have a fire department, we have police, we have all these things. That's Western civilization that comes from making things better. But in this world, is that the way it is all over the world? No. There are, civil, uh, there are cultures that, and, and, and nations, they don't have that. I've been to those places, been some of those places. Injustice is all over the place. Abuse is everywhere. Corruption is everywhere. Uh, you talk about pain and torture, it is everywhere. And people have been raised in that poverty of that idea. And then, but here's the thing. A lot of them become believers. There are people that go to those places, places that I've been, that are working there, and they lead people to Jesus. And they, you know what draws them to the Lord? Not He's going to make your life full of peace. Not he's going to prosper you and he's going to help you live a good life. You know what draws them to him? They see his suffering. And they're like, wow, he can relate to me. He has suffered. God has suffered like I have. And I want to worship a God who understands the injustices and the things that have happened to me. And they, they're willing to abandon all of that stuff that held them in that place. And they say, I want to follow Jesus. You see the difference? Western Christianity is way different. Everybody, all the past, you turn on, go around on, on, on YouTube or whatever. And uh, the, church, the pastors or preachers or whoever, you know what they're talking about? Give your life to Jesus, and he will make your life amazing. Right? That's pretty much the, me the message, right? <laughs> he will help you, and he will, it, it's, it's so good. It, they never talk about, hey, in this world, we live in a broken world, you might have to work through suffering. That's why a lot of Christians during COVID 
um, backslid, stop going to church. Hello? Because they like, oh, you know, I, you know, why is this all that, uh, you know, this suffering and all this stuff? It's like, I'm not going to persevere. There's churches that close down. A lot of churches close down, you know, because they had that idea that, hey, everything should be going good, and it's not going good, then God isn't, you know, he's not real. But brothers and sisters, working through issues that are painful, it's okay to go through that. Some of us are so addicted to this idea of God, God's whole plan for your life is no inconvenience. So when there's inconvenience in your life, discomfort in your life, you lose your salvation. <laughs> you like, all of a sudden, you're cussing, you're angry at everybody all around you. It's like, hey, I thought you were a Christian, man. What no, it's... What's going on in my life is wrong. And I want everybody to know it's wrong. Why is my tire flat? It shouldn't be flat. I'm a follower of Jesus. <laughs> I want everybody to know where are the donuts at the church? Why is there only muffins? <laughs> we... This is Western Christianity. It's almost like, uh, you know, we, we don't know how to suffer for the Lord, especially when God has planned it out. There's sometimes that happens. You just think about some Christians who go through struggles, you know, f uh, physically. They're going through things, and it's like, oh, you shouldn't be going through struggles at all. You, God is on your, you, you're a believing Christian and there shouldn't be no suffering in your life. That's not true, brothers and sisters. We, we are, look at here, here's Jesus. He's getting whipped. He's getting flogged. He wasn't healed instantly, okay? He was ripped, his back was ripped open with nails tied to the whip, beads of, of lead, bone, very graphic, very harsh, and he's being flogged by forces who want to portray to everybody and even to him and to themselves, we are in charge. You are not. That's what this world, that's what you and I battle with. You're not in charge, Jesus. I am. And I'm not going to go through suffering. I'm not going to go through any trial, any, any testing. I am in charge. Next verse. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they clothed him in a purple robe. Why did they do this? Were they, did they want to see how much pain he can endure? No. They wanted to cause infliction and pain, not on his physical body, but inside. You ever been, um, here's one thing, uh, um, guys, you guys know this. Uh, your ego can, can hurt not so much by how much pain was inflicted on you, but by how embarrassing something happened to you, right? Somebody comes up to you, you're all powerful, you're all strong, some young skinny person comes up and slaps you in the face. <laughs> There's nothing worse than being slapped in front of everybody, school, co-worker, being slapped in the face. It's like you just want to, I, and especially if it's, you know, some smaller, you know, person that you, you know you can't retaliate or you shouldn't retaliate. And you basically, you've been painted in the corner. Now what do you got to do with those emotions and feelings? You got to suck it up. <laughs> you got to internalize it. You know? This is what's going on to hit that what they're trying to do inside of him. They're trying to push his ego down by shaming him, putting on a crown of thorns because he's the king of the Jews. 
They put, on his, they, they put that on his head and they clothed him in a purple robe because that's what a king wears, royalty. Next one, next verse. Next verse. And he went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. They slapped him in the face. They're ridiculing him. They're again showing him, you're not powerful. You're not in charge. We are. Next verse. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. So he questioned Jesus and he comes to the conclusion, hey, he is innocent. Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. Yet he, what did he do to this innocent man? In the first verse, what did it say? He had him flogged. They, he was ridiculed by the soldiers. He was innocent. This man was innocent. I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. What is he trying to say here? By saying that. What, is, what, what does Pilate want to do? What's his action that he wants to do? Regarding Jesus. What? Wants to let him go. That's right. He wants to let him go. He's in power. He's in authority. He's the governor of that place. He married the sister of the, the king who was over all of Rome, the Caesar. He's not the sister, the daughter or the granddaughter, sorry, the granddaughter to the king of Rome. So in other words, he married so he can be in power. And that's why he's in power here. But what does he want to do? Let Jesus go? Can he? Can he really? Let's see. Next verse. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. So he knew he was innocent, but he didn't know he was God. Here's just a man. He's an innocent man, but he's just a man. And that's who he's presenting to the Jewish leaders. Next verse, in all of his shameful presentation. As soon as the chief priests, the ones who also had authority and power, and their officials saw him, what did they shout? Say it together. Yeah, so they have a will. They, they want done. They're shouting it out. Uh, Pilate answers, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. He didn't say he did not deserve crucifixion. He's, he, didn't, he, he didn't deserve a charge at all. He's completely innocent. Next verse. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die. Why? Because he claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the Son of God. Next verse. When Pilate heard this, read that last phrase of that sentence together. He was even more afraid. So he had a little fear. The most powerful man in that land. He had some fear. And he, after he heard that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, he was even more afraid. Next verse. And he went back inside the palace because when you're afraid, where do you go? You go home to remind you how powerful you are. <laughs> it's your comfort zone, right? You go to where you're comfort comfortable. You know, I, if, if you're out and about and you're in somebody's house or, some, you know, somewhere, it's unfamiliar. 
But when you need to sort of recoup your authority and re, you know, re, rejuvenate yourself as far as who you are, you go home. You go to the place that makes you feel good. He went back inside the palace. And he asks Jesus some questions. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. So again, the most powerful man in the land asked Jesus a question. What does, he want, what does he want from Jesus when he asks him a question? Does he want him to answer? Does he want him to say something? And what does Jesus do? Nothing. The powerful man can't even get an innocent man to say a word. Who's really powerful? Who really has the authority? Who really has the strength? Just by showing that he's silent, he's showing this man, you are not in charge. Next verse. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Because he's shocked. How dare you? I am in charge of Israel. I have been placed here by the authorities back in Rome. I am in charge. I'm powerful. I'm in control. Let me just remind you how powerful I am. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you in case you haven't forgotten? Next verse. Now Jesus answers. He doesn't answer his question. Where does he come from? He says something else. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you, not from Rome, not from these Jewish leaders, from above. Therefore, or because of this, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. What is Jesus doing here? He's going straight to the ego like they were going straight to his ego, trying to push him down, trying to sh shame him. He goes straight to there. He says, you're guilty, but there's other people that are more guilty than you. You're going to bear some guilt on this, whether you're trying to get out of it or not, but there are other people that are going to bear even more guilt. Either way, at the end of the day, we're all guilty. You guys are all guilty. You can't get out of it. Next verse. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus. He's trying to set Jesus free. Why? Because Jesus said he came to tell the truth. And the truth was guilt is coming down the tracks. And you're tied to these tracks. And it's going to come and it's going to get you. He's trying to get out of it. But he can't. Jesus tried to set Jesus, I mean, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. <laughs> but he can't do it. Aren't you glad you follow a powerful God? He's powerful. Are there things looming? in your life that seem are trying to remind you, trying to show you that they're in authority, that they're in power. There are things in this world, that's how it's being manifested, trying to come against you. But their will will not be done. Look at what, has, what it says. He tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting. If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Caesar is the guy that's in charge of all of Rome. He's the guy that put him in charge of this area that he's in charge of. And it says, anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. So Jesus was also claiming, other people, other Jewish people were claiming Jesus. He's the king of the Jews. Next verse. When Pilate heard this, you see... It's all political. It's all about power and authority for Pilate. 
he was worried, wow, if things get back to Caesar, that I'm allowing this man to live who people are claiming that he's the king of the Jews, Caesar won't have any other king ex in existence in his, in his land. He is the king, the, the king supreme. And so Pilate says, I lost. I can't do it. The most powerful man in the land can't let an innocent man go. Does he want to let him go? Yeah. You know, just to pause for a second here. We, sometimes we think we can do, we have authority, we can do whatever, right? We have strength, we have knowledge, wisdom, teaching, we have um, abilities, and we think we can do certain things. And um, so we think, when we think that way, we sort of raise up ourselves in our thoughts, thinking we have power. just like Pilate. But could Pilate do what he wanted to do? The most powerful man in the land? He couldn't. You know, that, that's a friendly reminder for you and I. You can't do everything that you think you want to do. Some of you are like, yeah, I can. I have the ability. I can do it. Okay. Here's a, here's a, a friendly reminder um, <laughs> that reminds us that we're human. Stop sinning. <laughs> Hello? Can you do that? <laughs> Hello? No, you can't. We need God's help. Everybody needs God's help. You're a sinner. Hello? <laughs> You're not an authority. Am I by myself here? Am I only one willing to admit I'm a sinner? We are sinners. We sin. You can't do it without the help of a more powerful authority. For some of us, it's easier to admit that we're a sinner and that we've sinned. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have talked to you this way. I shouldn't have whatever, you know. I shouldn't have put you down or, or I shouldn't have stolen or whatever, whatever it might have been. I shouldn't have done that. For some of us, we can admit that. Others of us... I mean, there's, there's places that's full of people that can't admit that. You know what they call that? Prison. <laughs> people that have been convicted with all the evidence, and they still will not admit it. <laughs> because in their mind, they never admit it. Never admit. <laughs> that's sort of like the, you know, the word on the street is never admit. Pilate couldn't admit. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha, the Stone Pavement. It's like he came in conflict and in contact with a brick wall, and we can just call that the Stone Pavement. All of us will come down to that place where we got to realize I am not in charge. This is what happens here. Next verse. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. And what does he say? Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. Next verse. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? He's asking them. In other words, he's relinquishing his power now. Because he wanted to set him free and realized he couldn't do it. And now he's listening to the words of the public. The words of the people that he's in charge of. What do you want me to do? What do they say? Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered, Wow. What a statement. Religious leaders are saying, We want to, we want to pledge our allegiance to earthly authority 
instead of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Wow. We are religious our whole life. The way we dress, the way we speak, the way we interact. We're getting ready for a Passover right now, and we can't even go around Gentiles because we're better than you. We're going to be unclean. We're religious, and we're, you know, we're, we have a relationship with God, and we keep commandment, his commandments. And we, we don't want Jesus, the Son of God. We want an earthly king. We believe in the earthly king. We believe in Caesar. We believe he's, if he's going to help us keep our power and our authority, if he's going to keep us from not going through what Jesus went through, getting whipped, getting ridiculed, uh, bit suffering, I don't want to be part of any God that allows himself to go through suffering. We want the king, the earthly king, Caesar. And not this Jesus. Because in our the theology, there is no suffering in our theology. In our theology, we're rich. In our theology, we don't go through problems. In our theology, God would not let this happen to his son. And because of that, we make our decision right now and clear as day. Take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Just think about that. Remember about that, about you and me. When we think we're religious, when we think we're, we're perfect, when we think we're, um, you know, beyond um, maybe, you know, beyond other people and looking down on other people. Never. We should never look down on any, anyone else. Jesus is going through this whole process because he's doing it for the people that are literally doing this all to him. He's doing it to these, for these chief priests who are saying we have no king but Caesar. He's literally dying for them. Last verse. Finally, the most powerful man who should be able to do whatever he wants in the land, finally, who wanted to free Jesus, finally, he wanted to he wanted to make it known that he found nothing wrong with him. He was innocent. He knew he was innocent. He didn't find anything worthy of being charged, let alone dying. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Uh, this, I, um, I don't want this to come off like, you know, God is trying to scare us or I'm trying to scare you that, you know, God wants you to suffer and all that stuff. I just want you to understand that there are good times with the Lord. There are tough times with the Lord. There are times that seem, you know, sort of like normal or flat. And there's steep hills we got to climb. Sometimes there's deep valleys we got to go through. But don't. Forget, brothers and sisters, Jesus, his will will be done, and he is more powerful than anything that you think is trying to convince you that they have the power. No. Jesus will say, he'll sing it to you. You know what he'll say? I've got the power. <laughs> <laughs> and he might also say as people are saying I'm going to get you we're going to get you we're after you and you can't run away and what is he going to say what is he going to say I can't touch this <laughs> Who really had authority? Who really had the power? Jesus. Always. Always. That's who I want to follow. That's who I want to 
pledge my life to. That's who I want to keep my eyes on, focus my attention on him. Like, wow, how is he going to do it? How is he going to get us out of this? How is he going to do it? These are all the physical powers and authorities that he's sort of playing against here. When he gets on the cross and when he dies, now he's like unleashed like a lion going after the spiritual powers. Where are they at? Where are they at? And he just starts body slamming, slaying demons, principalities. He's just slapping them all over the place. He even comes to death and he says, who do you think you are? Boom, I rise up. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you and me. Who has the authority? Who has the power? My God. My goodness. He is amazing. That's who we're focused on. That's who we're enduring through hardships and tough times. He's given us so much to be thankful for, hasn't he? That's why we lift our eyes away from the storms in life, the waves that get high. That's why, because he is the one that has the power, not those waves, not those winds, not that weather, not that flame, not that person, not that sickness, not any of these things. He, God has all authority, and we're going to stay focused on him because he's got the power. And what about me, Jesus? Can't touch this. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a few moments. <laughs> Lord, we're so, we have a smile on our face because you do have all the power. And we are in your hands. And you are the best protector. You're the best provider. We surrender to your will. We don't fight against it. We don't wonder and ask questions about it. So, Lord, we just thank you that you are the one in who's in control. And you have our best interest always at heart. So thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your love. And thank you for the cross. All that you've done in us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be up here at the front at the end if you want to pray together. We can pray together. Um, I'm glad to get in, the, in this chapter of 19. It talks about, um, you know, the crucifixion and... We don't just celebrate the crucifixion on, and the resurrection on Easter, right? It's all throughout our lives, every day. So we're, so we're going to have Easter services the next few weeks, celebrating the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord, because it brings life every single day. We're going to pray for this morning's offering. We just want to say thank you for how you have been faithful. Thank you for how... You have been responding to God's nudging and um, instruction to your life on how to give, how you're going to get through whatever it is you're getting through financially. We honor him with our gifts. We honor him with our first fruits. It's just a way of being honoring to the Lord, you know, and we're not giving it to a man. Sometimes people think, we, oh, you're giving it to, you know, Anthony or whoever, you know, we're not giving it. It's this this church. He said, upon this rock, I will build Anthony's church, April's church, Ross's church, <laughs> Charles's church. No, it's his church. So we give, and God is faithful as we give to him. So some, who are we going to have pray for this, this morning's offering? Come on over, Reuben. He's going to pray for this morning's offering. Good word, amen. 
So this morning, good morning. I'm going to pick up tithes and offerings if we can all uh, bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you again, Lord. We ask that you would bless this offering, uh, make it multiply for your use and your goodness, Father. We thank you. We ask, Lord, also that you'd be with us throughout this week, Father. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Take my life and form it. Take my, my will, transform it. Take my Stand together. Come here. <laughs> All right, now go in the thor the authority that God has put upon your life. Not because you're making it happen, because He's making it happen through you. Watch what he does watch what he does and don't hold it to yourself I want to know we want to know what God has done in your life God bless you have a wonderful day have a wonderful week be blessed in Jesus name amen <laughs>